Victor J. Stenger is a renowned experimental physicist and the author of the New York Times bestseller, God, The Failed Hypotheses. Victor, why does anything exist at all? Well, uh, I mean, you're asking uh, a philosophical question, and I, I have to say right up front that I'm, I'm a scientist, but I'm a physicist in particular, but also I'm not a, a theoretical physicist, and theoretical physicists tend to be Platonists, whereas I'm a, an ex, uh, my background is as an experimental physicist, and I tend to be instrumentalists. And so I, I tend to shy away from from uh, questions such as that, or why, why questions, let me put it this way, because all we really know about and can know about is what we observe. And, and, and uh, what we observe is, is uh, described in terms of uh, uh, models and so on that we invent. And, 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 uh, and, and that's the way it is, and, uh, and maybe that's just a cop-out, but uh, I don't know how anyone could say anything else. With me, in terms of the problematic definition of nothing, it encompasses two points. One of them is when you start defining nothing, as you said, then you start giving it properties and attributes, and then nothing becomes something. Now, this is obviously a typical accusation levied at uh, people like uh, Lawrence Krauss in, in his book. But at the same time, I do seriously think that defining nothing is impossible almost by definition because outside of space time and the universe itself they can't be such a thing as an intrinsic nothing because you're always referring nothing to being the absence of something so it's still never an intrinsic nothing so when we talk about this in a cosmological sense just to put it down in a, in a general way we mean nothing by no space no time no molecules no atoms no particles no nothing but you're still defining a blank empty space as potentially having something and that that's very problematic when it comes to um, the definitions of nothing now we yeah, so, so if i could interject sure. the uh i have a, a, also a different uh philosophy than than most physicists uh, who, who write up write for the popular media including people like lawrence krauss who's very good of course uh and, and that is they still tend to think there's there's uh uh some reality to to space and time, some metaphysical reality to space and time. And I just view these as human uh, contrivances. We've invented them uh, uh, and put them into models that describe what we observe with our senses and with the instruments we, we use to aid our senses. And to the extent that we use these models, we can define things like the vacuum, for example. You can take, you can, you can define a vacuum, you can write the wave function down for, for a quantum wave function down for a state with no particles. I mean, so does that define it as a real thing? It, yes, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's something we can describe within the framework of our, our theories, but that doesn't mean it has some intrinsic metaphysical reality that we're describing. It's a contentious issue in the philosophy of science, but obviously we can describe phenomena mathematically, we can confirm it by looking at various aspects of data, and we can make predictions about it. I've, I've heard you briefly talk about this before, and um, it sometimes strikes me that you're almost an anti-realist philosopher of science, and I, I sometimes wonder, you may be in the wrong profession. But uh, all jokes aside, now... Um, I have, well, I have, I have a lot more respect for philosophy, let's say, than a lot of, of physicists. Yes, I, I, I really think that uh, some of them have gone overboard in the criticism of philosophy. I think philosophy is very valuable in helping us clarify uh, what we think. But at the same time, I also believe that you don't get any place with pure logical arguments. That uh, any logical argument, uh, the conclusion you make from a logical argument, is already built into the assumptions that you've started with. So you learn nothing new from it. The only way you can learn anything new is by interjecting uh, some something from some other source that could be revelation if you believe in god and revelation that's that's another source that I, I don't happen to believe in that i believe the only source is is observation and the basis of that is that that's something that has worked very well for us mm -hmm. uh, in application whereas uh, revelation and uh, religious ideas haven't worked for us at all so it's just a pragmatic basis sure, i think sure. that's that's the attitude i take 
That's very interesting. You, you're now also doubling up as a potential theologian, Victor. But um, <laughs> um, with this, we, I mean, you've made um, very valuable points here in terms of metaphysics, the definitions of nothing, how it's problematic when we look at any worldview. With, with this in mind, a slightly changing track because another issue that becomes fundamental in this, both from a theistic or an atheistic position of one of just pure metaphysics or one of just pure um, theoretical physicists that deal with cosmology and quantum mechanics is this issue of necessity. How, how do you feel what kind of arguments can be made about it was impossible for there not to be nothing? Well, you know, again, you're trying to draw me into into uh, philosophical arguments that number one, I'm not that expert on, uh, and number two, I kind of don't have much interest in. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough, fair enough. But uh, but so yeah, so uh, I mean, I yeah, I, I it's again it, it, arguments over words, the meanings of words, and so on. I, I you know, I'm really I'm really turned off by. Uh, by those discussions, I'm willing to get into them if if you start bringing in uh, uh, facts about the world. You know what we know about the world and how we describe it, uh, and whether we can do that in a, in a rational way. But uh, uh, I don't even know uh, what to say. To, what can you ask uh, about necessity? Okay, okay. Let's see if it I can take, enti- it take it- something necessary. I don't know. <laughs> Let me see if I can entice you into this another way. So, for example, in, uh, this is a very limited area that I know in terms of um, quantum wave fluctuation and quantum fields, and this is obviously an area that you would know significantly. Now, if we have quantum wave fluctuations and particles come in and out of existence, it, it then initially starts off with states of high symmetry, but then that breaks into more asymmetrical structures. So existence coming out of quantum wave fluctuations it was much much more highly likely that it happened therefore it would almost be at least almost impossible for there not to be aspects of a big bang is this a correct approach to take with science and if so does that make non-existence far more impossible yeah i mean that's basically it i mean we have we have these models and excuse that. No, uh, no, no, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, 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 just let it ring for a second. My wife will pick it up. Okay, good. Uh, we have we have these models, and uh, what's interesting about them is 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 that uh, they are based on actually very the most simplest uh, assumptions that you can make. Namely, that if you start with a description in terms of space and time that has no particles, now this is again space and time is your own invention. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it's it's a contrivance, uh, but you, if you start to try to write a model down uh, that describes nothing in terms of space and time, it automatically contains things like conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, conservation of angular momentum. And so on. In other words, perfect symmetry leads to much of physics as we know it. And, and so uh, that particular description, you apply it to the early universe, and you find that's really all you need, that uh, uh, such a picture uh, uh, based on perfect symmetry is going to have quantum mechanics in it. It's going to have general relativity in it. It's going to have all the conservation principles in it. But when you start trying to write the model down, you can't. You can't write it down in any way that doesn't have these principles in it. And so you just then apply that model and see what it, what it asks, what it tells you. And it tells you that there's going to be a fluctuation that produces that and, uh, a, a expanding universe. It's, it's amazingly simple. I think a lot of my colleagues, my more theoretical colleagues, the ones who are certainly more expert in the mathematics than I am, uh, 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 get it to all kinds of uh, greater details, but I think the story is really that simple. So, because of the fluctuations, is it inevitable that there will be something? Yeah, I think that's right. I think in that picture, it's inevitable that uh, something will will come out of it. Well, it makes reasonable sense to me, and um, I take in, uh, your word and expertise that there is the mathematical models in, in detail that will back this up. One thing you touched on earlier that is another interesting point in here is this existence of eternity and 
coinciding with it, Infinity that operates with it. So before, obviously, the Big Bang inflationary cosmology picture, there was obviously the steady state theory in the universe, which was the universe had always just existed. Then the, the Big Bang came along and slightly altered that to a certain extent. But people like yourselves and, and many other physicists now believe that, yes, there was a Big Bang that came from somewhere, but there basically been this infinite existence of even if there's a vacuum space behind it now a lot of people believe this in physics and it, it, the approach is twofold because the the physicists here deal with this concept of uh, an eternity or at least some kind of infinity that's going backwards for forever and that can explain why things arise from the vacuum now bs at the same time also use that to explain the role of an infinite god that's behind it but i take the view that if you can explain it in terms of infinity in the scientific realm with mathematical models then you don't need a god now i'm not going to get you to comment on god because i know you're an atheist so there's no point even mentioning that even though you're very good at arguing metaphysics how do you see this infinity giving rise to the big bang and is it a fundamental play in a backdrop well you see again the, the, there's a word problem here and that, that word infinity uh it, it, when it's used by physicists, it's really used to mean unlimited, mm. endless, you know, rather than some uh, more abstract use that you'll find in mathematics. Uh, uh, and so I would, I try as much as possible not to use in the word infinity, but to say endless or to say unlimited. Mm. Okay, so then, uh, you have uh, the theological argument, and I'm going to get into that, uh, by people like William Lane Craig, uh, that, uh, and I've heard this not only from him, but I've heard this in a number of debates, although I, I think the people who debate them read, read William Lane Craig's debates and then just try to follow what he does, uh, on, at least on the, uh, on the Christian side. And uh, he uh, he talks about how the universe can't be eternal, eternal in the past, because it uh, uh, it would have taken an infinite time to reach the present. And uh, I think that's again a, a misuse of of the uh, mathematics. Uh, you can count backwards into the past, uh, second by second, tick on a clock by tick on a clock, one, two, three, four, in a negative direction, and you you never reach. Uh, uh, a beginning of the universe. The universe didn't begin an infinite time ago. It didn't begin at all. And that's the, uh, that's the big difference. And so you can't say that, it, uh, that it, uh, it couldn't have reached the present because it could have. Uh, no matter how far back you go in the past, there's still a finite time from then to now. So, so that argument uh, uh, doesn't work. He's also been heavily criticised by others in terms of he believes in abstract infinities, but not actual infinities. So just going back to what you said, so the universe never really began, it's always existed. So when we tie this into the Big Bang model, is the multiverse basically possible? Is it a foregone conclusion? How does this tie into the universe always existing? Well, the multiverse idea seemed to be almost automatic. As soon as people are, you know... Uh, uh, like Alan Guth and, mm. and, and, and Andre Lidde and Alex Lemkin started thinking about inflation, uh, they, they said, well, you know, if, if this, uh, happened for us, it, it should happen every place else as well. In fact, it was hard to deny it, uh, that, that, uh, there would be other, other, uh, uh, universes besides our own. So, so, uh, that's, you could, the way you could put it is that it's very much, multi-universe is very much implied by the best we know, our best knowledge of modern cosmology. Now, of course, the argument against it is that, is that uh, we don't see any other universes. And that's uh, an important argument, of course, because uh, if we had no way of ever confirming it, uh, it would be an empty idea. Uh, but uh, fortunately, there is a possibility of us observing another universe. It will be the greatest discovery of history. Mm -hmm. We may even be on the verge of that. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to claim we've got it. It will be many years before anybody will, will 
have enough data and enough uh, convincing evidence to to make such a statement. But it's possible that uh, if our universe started as this bubble, it 